All right, guys, welcome to uh, episode four. Tonight, we're going to talk about guides life. Uh, we're going to talk about the do's and don'ts of being a guide, how we got there. Uh, we got some awesome guests again tonight. Uh, we brought back Blair. Blair's been on the last three, but such a great resource. It's uh, impossible not to invite him. And we uh, have Steve Yadish. Steve? Uh, I, Steve and I know each other, but don't know a lot of his background. So I'll, when we get to him, we'll uh, have him kind of give us what uh, what his experience is. And of course, Darren Wandy, my partner in crime. All right, fellas. So we're gonna uh, we're gonna lead off with just basically a question to all of us. Uh, Steve, maybe you can fill us in on your background, and then uh, basically we're gonna talk about how you got started in guiding and where you're at today. Sure. Yeah. Um, so I guess my background is I'm a farm kid from Central Saskatchewan, uh, born and raised hunting and fishing, just like the rest of us. You know, I was lucky enough to have good family that uh, got into all that stuff and took me along as a kid. Uh, my grandfather was a trapper, uh, took me out and uh, showed me all that stuff. I was lucky, you know, eight, six, seven, eight years old, you know, it's starting out doing, going along, at least riding in the truck and, and learning the trapping and, and uh, started hunting. And when I was uh, 19 years old, I just decided, um, I was a trades guy, a welder by trade. I'm a welder plumber by trade, but uh, decided that I wanted to start going out into the outdoors and making a living out there. So back in those days, I, you know, you didn't just jump into guiding. I didn't know anybody. Uh, and I always read the stories. I was a big Jack O'Connor fan, so I loved the mountain hunting. Never been out there. Uh, read all the books. Um, the Western Producer, the farm newspaper, used to be the only way to go. And, and uh, there was an ad in there looking for guides and wranglers. I s mailed off a resume. Guy phoned me two weeks later um, from the northern Yukon. He said, yeah, we love Saskatchewan farm kids. He said, you guys know how to work. So... He said, if you want to come up, he said, I'll pay you 75 bucks a day to be a Wrangler and uh, you can come up and see the country and work for a season. So I got a ride out to central Alberta, jumped in a truck with a guy I'd never met before who was a guide up there. And we drove all the way up to uh, Dawson City in the Yukon and uh, about, I think it was 130 days later, I came home and uh, had a, the greatest experience ever. And what was a what started out as a one-time deal, like I just wanted to try it and see the country. Uh, I was lucky enough to get to actually guide my first year. Um, one of the other guides had an injury and couldn't finish his moose caribou hunts at the end. So after being a wrangler for uh, about two months or two and a half months, I got to guide moose caribou hunts. And uh, yeah, it's been downhill ever since. This year will be my 20. 24th year of guiding um so what turned out or what started as a one-year deal turned out to be a career um i ended up you know I, I i work at a lodge in a fishing lodge in northern saskatchewan right on the border of the northwest territories and uh and own my own place in northeastern british columbia now so yeah i my my living is in the outdoors now, Steve, uh, he's a, a regular visitor. I get him in once a year into my uh, wildlife management class. He's been coming in and, and giving kids the uh, kind of the, the homegrown version of uh, what you can do in the outdoors. And he's, uh, he's very uh, humble when he says his background because he's actually pretty extensive. Some of the things he has said to my class in the past about, you know, catching sturgeon and tagging them. And he teaches that uh, campus. Uh, in northern Saskatchewan that, um, you know, that dabbles in a bunch of different things. He's actually an instructor at, at SIAST, uh, Poly, SAS Polytech now, actually. So when he, he's given us a little bit of a background, he's just kind of touching the outer limit here. So we're lucky to have Steve tonight. He's uh, well rehearsed in, uh, in, the, um, in the outdoors, in the industry. So I'm glad to, we have him on tonight. Well, I appreciate, appreciate you guys asking me. 
Well, we got lots to talk about, but Blair, why don't you give us a little bit of your background and where you're at in guiding? Yeah, same thing. I grew up a Saskatchewan farm boy, Ukrainian, and uh, basically since I was a kid, I loved hunting and fishing and being outdoors. And uh, like even in high school, I was buying hunting and fishing magazines when I was nine, ten years old. And uh, actually, it started out the buddy of mine bought a bear camp in that and since I'd had quite a few years of bear experience I jumped in on the team and been guiding ever since over 25 years now so been 11 years at the camp I'm at now with Dean and Spirit Creek but yeah I just love being outdoors and the Saskatchewan farm boy and I love hunting and fishing it was a strong passion of mine I mean <clears throat> I've had to quit jobs and get divorced over it but <laughs> <laughs> hey uh uh steve uh we'll come back to blair too but steve what species do you guide for um so in in my hunting area in british columbia we do black bear moose elk um, white-tailed deer mountain goats um and then small game species you know wolves and and whatever happens to come by after that uh we used to do grizzly bear but there's a closure on grizzly bear hunting right now but yeah, so a little bit of everything. I don't have any sheep tags, but uh, we do some mountain goats. And Blair, you? Um, do spring bear and spring goose, and then we do the fall bear and waterfowl, and then the white-tailed deer. Right on. Well, Look, for we're, forget we're forgetting one person. Yeah? What's your background? You used to be huh. a professional guide? Uh, so for me, it got started. I was just I just graduated from high school. And I got a job in the oil patch. And being that I was only 18, just turning 19, um, that was a year that the crash, kind of like right now, where oil went down to $10 a barrel. And I got laid off. So I was just, uh, I picked up a Western producer. And uh, I was looking for a trucking job. Because uh, when I turned 18, I got my 1A license. And uh, I was just looking for a uh, farming job to haul grain till the oil prices came back because my my job my boss came to me and said would I take a uh, layoff so that the married guys and stuff like that would have uh, a little bit more money so I said sure and uh, so yeah I just picked up a western producer and there was actually a art uh, an advertisement for a for an outfitter that I did up a resume for sent it off and they didn't even reply to me but in that same um, in that same western producer was a a uh, an ad for a guide school and uh i applied for that and they were only taking five people and i got accepted to that which is it turned out to be a bit of a farce in the sense that i sort of had to pay for my own guide school but in the sense that he got free labor out of us but uh, i i paid for this guide school i was kind of like you uh steve i I'm, I'm from southeastern saskatchewan i never even seen a horse or any, like i never rode a horse in my life or anything like that i jumped on a plane flew to white horse yukon and uh the, the outfitter picked me up and spent the first two weeks learning how to cape animals and we and took a ferrying course and then once we did that we packed up his horses and we rode 16 days straight to the Arctic Circle to where his concession was in up north of the Arctic Circle on the Bonnet Plume. And, uh, and we did a whole month of, of learning to be a guide up there. And he was going to give two guides the, uh, a job at the end of this guide school. And there was five of us that started. One guy washed out pretty early. And then there was four of us left. And there's two kids from um the, the the dude ranch in i think it's in alberta the the gang ranch or something like that they're cowboys so the outfitter basically had who he was going to pick early into the uh to the school because i had no experience i never rode a horse before all that kinds of stuff and i came with shoddy equipment and so he he thought i was going to wash out too so me and this other guy did make it to the end, but he had already offered this job, this sheep guiding job to these other two uh, Alberta guys. So he came to me and he said, I feel bad because I, I honestly didn't think you're going to make it, but you made it. So he wrote me up a letter of recommendation to this outfit, his buddy in, in Northern BC. And they hired me without even seeing me. So I drove from uh, Whitehorse Yukon down, down the Alaska highway to Fort Nelson, then Fort St. John. 
And you know, I, the, the super ironic thing is the outfitter that he re recommended to me that hired me was the same one I put the application in that didn't even reply to me. And, uh, and so I got that job. And the first few years, I did all the species. I did elk, moose, uh, black bear. We did some grizzly at the time, uh, Rocky Mountain goat. And I wasn't a sheep guide, but we did all that other kinds of stuff. So I did that for about the first four or five years. And then after that, for the rest of my guiding career, I just, I just did like kind of like three to five day mini elk hunts. And I just took elk hunter after elk hunter. And, and that's uh, how I, how I just kind of fell in with, with elk. But uh, like one of the, one of the coolest things about being a guide for me was I met what I would consider one of my best friends, lifelong buddies at that camp, he, the, you know, the godfather to my, uh, to my son, Ryan. And uh, if it wasn't for that, I don't even think I'd be doing the job that I'm doing right now. If it wasn't for being a guide, like you learn so many life skills and stuff like that. Um, I would thank goodness I was young when I did it because I don't think I'm almost 50 now. I don't think I could handle the, the pressures of what entails to, to be a guide at the time, but I was eager to learn. And, uh, and I also had a job that when I came back to Saskatchewan, my outfitter would let me take three months off. So I'd leave in beginning of August. I wouldn't show up until uh, mid October again. So he, it was good. So that's how it got started for me. Cool. So just in the sense of somebody who maybe doesn't really get it, like, Oh, you're a hunting guide. You get to hunt every day. That's not how it works. Right. Uh, you get her up before everybody, you go to bed after everybody goes to bed. Uh, there's lots of different uh, hierarchy, I understand, in a, in a hunt camp or a fish camp. So for somebody who maybe is interested in, in maybe pursuing that, that dream or, or uh, going out, those, what are some key things or some tips that would help them maybe land a job in that situation? You know, is it the horse, the horseback riding skills or learning, you know, how to cape animals. What are some little pointers that somebody who maybe is trying to get into that field, what can you kind of give them some advice to, to, to hone their craft? Um, well, for me personally, I think the number one thing I look at is, is work ethic and enthusiasm. If somebody's willing to learn and willing to work hard because you guys all know guiding is like you said, Darren, you're up before everybody and you go to bed after everybody. And, and if, if they're willing to put in the time and listen and, and learn and work hard, I'm willing to teach them. It's great if they have a background, um, you know, grew up hunting, fishing, the, the skin and caping, gutting, all that stuff is horseback experience. That all plays into it. I, I, definitely but i would think that for me personally is a uh, respect for the outdoors a good work ethic and a willing to willingness to learn i think are your keys right off the bat blair yeah same thing i would say work ethic and enthusiasm but a big thing is be a man of your word dependability like be there be like whatever you say like i said it's long days early hours and just be dependable and ambitious. And I mean, you'll go places like that. Like you said, as long as you got a willingness to learn, same as what Steve said, it's basically just like that. Just a hard work ethic. I think one of the, th one of the things that uh, people think is that we somehow, uh, well, we are, we do go along with the hunters on their hunts, but we don't take those trophies home. While we have the uh, the memories of that, I think a lot of people think it's glamorous to be a guide because we're involved in all these hunts. But uh, I, I give you an example of what it was like on a regular day for in my camp was you have to get up at usually around four o'clock in the morning, uh, go looking for the horses because we hobbled and belled our horses, so we had to go find them. So at four o'clock in the morning, you put rubber boots on, there's generally frost on the, on the grass, and so you're cold. You go find the horses. When you get the horses back, you gotta saddle them, get them ready, then you have to make breakfast for your hunter. And then you, once you make breakfast for your hunter, then you gotta get loaded up and then you gotta hunt. And if you don't kill anything that day, you come back and your day sort of repeats in reverse at the end of the day you make supper turn the horses loose so on but if you happen to be successful 
that's when your work really, really uh, starts because you have to, you have field care and all that kind of stuff. But um, it's, it really isn't glamorous. Like Steve, you said you started at $75. That's what I started at too, was $75. And I got bumped up to a hundred dollars a day uh, as I got uh, more experience. And I thought that was just awesome. And, but it really isn't a hundred dollars a day from working four in the morning till sometimes 11, 12 at night, and then getting four hours of sleep. It, it really, it was, it wasn't, but I'd say the biggest thing that you have to do as a guide is you have to be, have to have patience because that's all this job is about because it's not about you. You are a good hunter and you're trying to find your, your clients, a, a, a good trophy. But at the end of the day, it's all about their experience. They're the ones that paid the big dollars. And even though we, we're in the bush for three months at a time and we're missing our families or we're missing, uh, you know, we're so repetitive, you still have to, you still have to put, pull your boots on and, and do that job. So yeah, you really have to ha check your attitude and stuff like that. Absolutely. And, and you'll get guys in. So whether your turnover for guys is seven days or 10 days or two weeks or whatever, whatever the length of the hunt may be, you're going to be two weeks tired being out in the mountains or being out in the bush or wherever you, you know, I've, I've guided bears and stuff in Saskatchewan too. And that is a, that's a grind. Um, and you're, you're tired. You say goodbye to those guys that were successful in their leaving camp. And the next thing you know, you've got guys coming into camp. They're hot. They're happy. They've been waiting a whole year for this hunt to happen or this fishing trip or whatever. Their, their tails are wagging. They're, they're, they're looking forward to this and you've got to pick your, your game up and you got to be spry and you got to be, happy and you you've got to be enthusiastic and do that all over again and and it may be a hundred days like my my average shift is probably just over a hundred days and I've done as long as 130 days of guiding and and you know try to try to keep that enthusiasm up for for that long I mean it's tough it can be tough you're gonna obviously um both you guys have all three of you have lots of experience so you're going to see the whole gamut ran of clientele you're going to see people who can afford luxury can afford just the write a check and you're going to see somebody who saved up their entire life to go on a specific trip can, can you share one of those one of those um you know average joes that saved and maybe what what species they're after or maybe the reaction they had I know, Steve, we talked about this in my class and, and some of the things that you've seen over the years, but I just like to hear maybe one of those stories that, you know, is kind of reminisces with you in your heart that, of, uh, you know, the average Joe. Well, I, I'll go with it. Uh, I have one that sticks to mind, um, was an elk hunter I had. Uh, I've, I've been with my wife since 1994. So we've been together for a long time. And so she had to put up with me going to the bush, bush for basically 10, 12 years in a row. And in, I want to say 19, no, it was about 2000, 2000, yeah, 2000, just before 9-11 and 2001, uh, Sonia decided that she's going to come to the bush with me for three weeks and the outfitter was okay with that. And she wasn't there as a guy, as a, as a cook or anything like that. She literally was just going to come and, uh, and see the, what it was like. And, uh, she, had, so I hunted mainly out of what we called base camp. Uh, that was kind of my area and that's where the main airstrip is. So we were waiting for the elk hunters to come in on the plane and Sonia had spotted this big herd of, uh, elk on the on the adjacent mountain so quite a what about a mile or two away and there was a really nice big six by six bull that was running this herd of about 15 cows and so she came and told me about it and when I heard from the outfitter that the fellow I was getting was one of those guys that had saved up for like 10 years he was a uh, he was from Pennsylvania but like he literally had just your minuscule job where uh, he had to put away money every paycheck for 10 years to pay for this hunt. And so when I heard about that, I was like, that's his joke. That's his, his, uh, his elk. So they flew in, uh, 
the, in the early morning and uh, we made a plan for the next day and that elk was out there. We crossed the river and we went up in there and it took us a good part of the day to get up where he was, but it was your classic bugle hunt. Like a, I called the bull in. He, you know, he didn't have a lot of money. He just brought a 270 for a gun, which at the time I didn't think was enough, but anyways, that's all he had. Um, and he shot this bull and it was probably there, out of out of all the bulls it's probably in my top three nicest looking more classic really big six by six but it, it just showed that this guy saved up for 10 years to do a dream hunt that I was going to do whatever it took and and I'll never forget that guy he was like he he was so modest that he it was such a big bull that I kept he he didn't want to take the cape because he couldn't afford to get a taxidermy so he kept saying no I'm not taking it. I tr I pleaded with him to do the head mount for it but he did not want to take it because he couldn't afford it and that's a, so uh I his name is is um uh I can't remember his name right now, but I can remember his face. And he shot that bull on his first day. So they came in the one day, the next day was their first day hunting. And he paid for a seven day elk hunt and he had no money to hunt a moose or a goat or anything like that. So for seven days, he chopped wood for us and helped around camp. But I'll never, I'll never forget that guy for as long as I live. And uh, it just sticks in my head because that's the guy that I want to do all that hard work for. Absolutely. I've, I've got a, a very similar story. Like you, you always really, it seems like extra pressure when you get those guys that are on the once in a lifetime deal. And uh, I had a, a similar guy uh, guiding in the Yukon, gets off the plane. He's a, he was a concrete, he owned a small concrete company in Flagstaff, Arizona. And so this guy gets off the plane and he's in his late forties and just, well, he, he still worked. He ran a wheelbarrow on a concrete company so the guy was in good shape turned out he ended up he went through college on a baseball scholarship so he he was he could he could walk and we ended up in the mountains on a doll sheep hunt and it was the third day and it was it was fantastic the way it worked out we we spotted the sheep it was a long walk we ended up getting there we got in there just before dark the sheep came over right where it needed to go he kills the ram down it goes we block it up. We end up back at camp at like 2.30 in the morning, something like that. You know, next morning we're soaking our feet in the little creek that's beside camp because we're so sore. But it was just a fantastic hunt and same deal. Like he was, he you know, wasn't, most of those guys back then were talking life-size mounts and things like that. He's like, he's like, what do, what do these things look like in a European mount? He, would, he didn't even really want to do a big mount as well, but it was a, it was a fun hunt and yeah i agree those guys that puts a little extra pressure but it's a lot, a lot of reward when you can and i think that's for me anyway uh, my evolution as a guide when i first started out i was all about the hunting i always wanted to go up and i wanted to hunt sheep and i wanted to hunt elk and i wanted to hunt moose and bears and all that stuff and it was about me going on these hunting trips and taking these guys along but as 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 my career progressed you really start to think back um, the the pleasure that you can you, the the satisfaction or the, the the happiness that you can give your guests your your hunters or your fishermen or whatever I mean that's what it you, you're giving it's something that we get to do every day but they either wait a year or they wait a lifetime for that and and that's our reward is those guys you, you I'm Blair my, you know, we're, how many fridges are you on in around, you know, you're sitting there behind a, a an elk, a bear, a deer, a, a whatever, smiling, shaking the hand of a, of a hunter who's, who's just had the best experience of his life. And, and your face is on his fridge somewhere or in his office on, in a, in a frame. And I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a moment in his life that he'll never forget. You got to give it to him. You know, yeah. that's. I've never heard that what you said there about how it started for you. It was about you at the beginning. And, and I, I, I couldn't say that any better. That was, that's exactly the way it was for me. I was a 19 year old, just turning 20. It wasn't about the clients at that point. It was about what adventure I could go on. And like we were talking before the show started, uh, if it wasn't for guiding, I wouldn't be a police officer. The, 
the 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 lessons I learned on the back of a horse or on the side of the mountain, uh, it all comes back to guiding and the la life lessons I learned. But it didn't start out be for the guy that was showing up. It showed up for me and progressed to, uh, like you said, the, all the all the pictures that we all have of all the animals that we got. And yeah, and th I think that is why I am where I am right now in the hunting industry, where I just love giving back to people. Is it, it goes back to what you said. It you what started off for me, and then it went to went to them, and I couldn't have said it any better. That's awesome. Larry, you know, I know. You story that's, first? So, that's so true. Like you said, you start the week off in camp with a certain hunter and you're matched up, it's like you're a team. And then by the end of the week, it ends up being a lifelong friend. And I mean, like I said, I remember, actually not that many years ago, there was a retired school teacher from Oregon, saved his whole life to come up there out in Saskatchewan and his wife wanted a color faced bear. And he, he was an awesome guy, super guy. And you know, like you said, you want to work hard for those guys. And uh, he tried hard all week. Like he was one of those guys that just he didn't get the lucky stand or the bears weren't coming in for some reason. So it's like the fifth day, he's kind of getting down and depressed. And it ended up working out. He killed a beautiful color face bear. And I, like, I'll remember him for the rest of my life. He was so excited. He was shaking so bad. But I mean, when guys break down in the bush after they've harvested an animal, right there, I know I did my job. But, and that, that means more to me than anything. Like you said, when you first start out, you're thinking more about yourself. But later on, as you get older and that, you realize like those, those clients, like I think about the client, like you said, some of them come because they got lots of money and they're repeat customers. And then you'll get those bucket list guys that just come once in a lifetime and they've saved their whole life. And just to see the smile on their face, to see them break down after a successful hunt, that just, it blows me away. It's why I do it. I mean, it's not like we get rich from it, but I mean, it means more to me to see to make someone else happy with a harvest or a hunt and have a lifelong friend at the end of that hunt than anything. Uh, so fellas, if, if we were to share some of our knowledge when it came to getting started in this industry, if somebody was to watch this right now, and I'm sure we all sit around tables when we're at uh, people's places and they want to pick our brain about our experiences what do you think that they would need to bring to the table? If you like put your outfitter hat on right now, um, what are you looking for, for experience? And what do the, what do, what do guides need to bring to the table uh, in order for them to get a job? Steve, you start since you are an outfitter. Okay. Um, well, I guess if I'm looking at a stack, of, uh, excuse me, if I'm looking at a stack of resumes, um, I'm going to pick through them and I'm probably going to look a little, I'm going to, I'm going to look for a hunting and fishing background right off the bat. I'm going to, I'm going to look for that, but I'm going to probably look a little deeper into their work experience to see what kind of jobs they did. Um, you know, even their address and where they came from and how, how I would think that they were you know, maybe raised or, you know, what kind of appreciation they might have for, for the outdoors or how, I guess if they're, if they're just starting out, how teachable they may be. Um, so if I would, if looking back on my experience on how I started, if I was to recommend to somebody that was just coming out of high school and was applying or looking to get into the the guiding industry what i would say to them was when you write a resume or you talk to an outfitter say i really want to get into the hunting business or really want to get into the guiding business and i don't care where i need to start um don't don't expect like number one thing is don't expect to guide your first year as far as i'm concerned um you you're going to come to camp and you're going to do the dirty jobs, whether it's cutting wood or digging a new outhouse hole or whatever it is. And you're going to get to learn little things along the way, but uh, you, you expect to go in there with the, the idea that you're just going to do every job under the sun. And when those jobs are done, you're going to get to learn the business and, and, and continue on. Um, 
my personal experience, I was very lucky with the first place that I went. When I showed up as a Wrangler, I was given to a guide um, who was, actually his name was Gene Park. And he was 62 years old at the time and still guiding sheep. And when I was assigned to him, he came up to me and said, he goes, you want to be a sheep guide, boy? And I said, yes, sir. And he said, well, do your chores in the morning. And he goes, I'll take you hunting every day. Screw up and you stay home. <laughs> and, and he was true to his word. Every day I did the same as you. Like we go out and jingle horses at, in the dark, try and find them and bring them back and brush them and cook breakfast and then saddle and ride out for the day and come back and he'd cook supper and I'd deal with the horses and cut them loose and, and you'd start over every day. And, uh, you know, you, you, it wasn't glory, but I got to learn and that was the best leg up I could ever get. So as if you're, if I was a young guy applying or a young person applying to, to, to get into the hunting industry, I'd say, just say you're willing to do whatever it takes. You're willing to work hard and you love the outdoors and, 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 uh, hope for the best, I guess. Hope you get a good outfitter. That's, that's going to give you the opportunity. What's your, you opinion gotta, on, what's your opinion on guide school, Steve? Um, I've never, I've never been to one. Um, I, like I said, I was lucky enough to get hired on as a Wrangler. And after I got my experience as a Wrangler working there, um, you know, it was, it was good. I think, I think if you have no base of knowledge, like if you have no background experience, I think it'd probably be a beneficial thing. Um, if you got the right guy you know, if you got the right school that showed you the right stuff, the guy that you, you went through, was that Charlie Stricker? It was Charlie Stricker. <laughs> you and I were neighbors back in the day there. Really? I worked, yeah. You worked on the Bonnet Flume and I worked yep. at, uh, and I worked over on the Dempster highway. Oh. I worked for Bonnet <laughs> So you and I were neighbors back in the day. And that's cool. Yeah. So I think if you could get somebody like Charlie that would show you the right stuff and make you work hard, I think, I think it'd be a great thing. Um, but I, you know, I, I'd really, if I was to apply to a guide school, I'd really do my homework on them before I, before I went to one. But Blair, what would you uh, tell somebody that come to you and said, Hey, I want to be a guide. <laughs> like, like you said, you got to look at their resume too. But I mean, with a kid out of high school, it's tough to say what their work ethic is and dependability, but with guys that have got experience, that's the thing. You got to look at guys that are loyal to a job. Like you might have some guys that work 20 jobs in five years. What does that say moving around? Like you want to look at dependability and loyalty and that, and uh, just have a strong work ethic and, and be a man of your word. That's the biggest thing. Cause there's probably a lot of guys that want to start out, but they got no hunting fishing experience. And that's one thing Saskatchewan too bad. They didn't have a guide school in Saskatchewan to train young guys like that. And uh, I mean, if they got a hunting and fishing background, that's great, but just a willingness to learn. And put in your hours, like you, like you said, it's, it's 20 hour days. Don't expect any less. And I mean, yeah, like I said, you got to give someone a, a chance. You know what I mean? You got to, because I mean, I've, I've vouched for guys before that turned out good, and I've vouched for guys that didn't turn out good. And I mean, you still got to give somebody a chance. But I like looking at the dependability and loyalty and how long they like to stay at a job kind of thing. But well, for me, uh, it's pretty simple. Uh, if I was an outfitter, which I'm not, I mean, I'm, I was a career guide, but if at the end of the day, one thing I learned from the two outfitters I worked for is you, you doesn't matter if you're a 20 year guy or a new guy, you have to keep your mouth shut because he's the boss and more guys got fired because they couldn't keep their mouth shut and they were told to do something. And and they just, they, they, they had an opinion and outfitters don't have the time for people with opinions. They, they tell you to do something, you have to do it. And I think that's why it's funny, Steve, our, our paths are so parallel because the outfitter I work for, he used to tell me, I love Saskatchewan guys because they work hard. Uh, he, he, he said he, he loved to hire uh, Saskatchewan guys because they would do whatever. And I wasn't a farm kid, but I still had the same mentality. And, uh, and so he, it, 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 it's funny how ours, ours parallel. Uh, so keep your mouth shut. 
you know, and for me, it doesn't even, you, you don't even have to be a good hunter. You just have to be willing to learn because you can, you can, you'll ne almost no camp. You'll become a guide right out of the gate. You'll have to mentor under somebody. And so, uh, you don't have to be the best hunter or fisherman. You just have to be willing to do it. So if you're told, and I'll give you a quick story. My second year there, I was still, I was still being seen and not heard. Like I would, I didn't want to get, I didn't want to get flown to the highway and fired. So if, if uh, and you, you laugh about that, Darren, but that's exactly what happened. Our outfitter would say, pack your stuff, you're going to the highway. And he'd fly him the 15 minutes to the highway and he'd say, you, you call your own ride to come pick you up. And the, we used to, it used to be a joke, oh, where's so-and-so? He got, he got flown to the highway. And uh, so, uh, for, so for me, a quick story about uh, 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 what we're talking about there is, uh, uh, shoot, what was, I lost my train of thought there, what we're talking about. That, Oh, rats. I had a good story about that. I just can't remember what I was. Listening. Keeping your mouth shut. Keeping your mouth shut. Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, so um, my good friend, Lonnie, is pretty much the reason why I was a guide. I met him my very first year. But on our second year, we got to run a camp together. And I got done hunting my elk early. So I got, I, I took a, a bunch of the horses back to main camp. And Lonnie was left there uh, on to hunt on foot. And Gary was going to pick him up with the super cub. And the, the, in, I don't know if you guys ever been to Northern BC when it gets late September, October, the wind gets to blow in for days and it's, it's the, they can't fly very often. So late September, um, Gary was supposed to pick Lonnie and his hunter up on the gravel bar. And because cap was already shut down and it was too windy. So I'm sitting at the supper table and I'm still not, type of guy that talked to Gary very often and he looks at me and remember I've only got one year of guiding under my belt and I'm not a horse person I I can ride a horse I can put shoes on a horse but I'm no cowboy and uh he looks at me and he goes Buck take two saddle horses and a pack horse and go get Lonnie well I don't even know where Lonnie was <laughs> and and I don't know if you've ever had to deal with these outfitters but they don't give you specific instructions they go you go past the lake and it's, it's, they called it, they called it the high trail. I don't even know what the high trail was. So I'm, so the next morning I'm trying to solicit to all the people around there to tell, tell me where the high trail <laughs> I, I, I tail tie all these horses and I head out. So I knew I could get to our camp because that was my hunting area. So I had no problem getting there. It's a five hour ride to where our hunting area was, but everything west of that, I've never been there ever. And, uh, and so I ride, it takes me well, five hours to camp, then another five hours, 10 hours to get to where Lonnie's supposed to be. And I'm riding along the gravel bar where they're supposed to be. And I kind of think I'm there and I find their camp and it's, uh, and it's, it's gone. Nobody's there. And the fire is just ashes and smoldering. So I stuck my finger in there and I'm like, it was pretty warm. So I knew that they had to been there, but I'm thinking uh, they must have, decided to walk because they're about two two days late now Gary's two days late for picking them up so I unsaddled the horses I uh, we're right by the river so I let them water and I'm like what do I do now I can't go back and tell Gary I didn't find Lonnie and his hunter and so I I just sat there for about an hour and give the horses a break I threw the I threw the uh, gear back on them and I rode 10 hours <laughs> straight back to camp that without taking a break I rolled in at like four in the morning and uh I let the horses go I snuck into bed next morning he looks at me goes where's Lonnie I said I couldn't find him and he's like he's like well no big deal he 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 went and found him but that's the kind of a person that you got to be as a guide I didn't know where I was going I didn't have a clue but he looked at me he says Buck go find Lonnie and it's a 10-hour horseback ride to an area I've never been and I did it and that's the kind of and I think that's why Lonnie or Gary liked us because that if that had been anybody else they'd have been they'd have said I don't know where he is I'm gonna get lost blah 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 and he does outfitters don't have time for people like that so I know that's yeah. a long story but that's that's the kind of people that if I was to hire I would want to know what their uh, work ethic is what's uh, obviously you guys <clears throat> you've all had guys in camp 
and you've all had to cook for different people. What what's the uh, what's the go to your kind of your recipe for something that's strictly a muck or strictly a Blair or strictly a Steve? What what's your go to when you have a guys in camp? What's the what's the go to recipe? Um, ribs on a smoker. <laughs> For me, it was always if we had fresh meat. It was always just uh, fresh meat on an open fire. That's yeah, always. I was just gonna say the same thing. That once you get once you get something down, I mean, you take those inside tenderloins, yeah, and you know, cooking those over an open fire. Those guys love that stuff. That's that's the end of their story right there. That's the satisfaction of the whole story. Uh, I always packed craft dinner because the Americans don't have that or didn't have that at the time. And I thought, even though we thought it was just super easy to make, they actually thought it was fantastic because they didn't have it. Right. So, and it was super easy to, to, to make craft dinner because you have to like the way it works in a bush camp, is you got to kill something to get your fresh food. Outfitters never send in fresh food or fresh meat. So you always have to work hard to get that first animal on the ground to get, to get the, uh, the meat in camp. So you're usually working your butt off so that you have something to cook. Yeah. No, you're, you're hundred percent right. And, and that's one of the things as an outfitter now um, that I usually try to, try to improve on is is a little bit of the food because they used to send us out there with nothing right you put a few things in the pack box and hope for the best but um now i i i generally try to get those guys if if they're moose hunters i get them on a moose steak in base camp and say now you got a taste for it, boys let's go get one or whatever mm -hmm. we're going for right but. so obviously I, I like to consider uh people that are guides in a camp to be kind of the utility knife or the Swiss army knife of all that's happening there. Cause you're doing everything from like Muck said, shoveling a hole for the toilet to taking these guys on a, on a big trip. Um, what, what was maybe one of the things besides the hunting that you really enjoyed or you still enjoy? What's the things that you're like, ah, I hate doing that. It's kind of one of the things that needs to get done but it, I, I just hate doing it. So one of the things that's ultimately the peak thing you like doing at camp and one of the things you obviously don't like in camp. You kind of broke up there, Darren. Can you say that again? So what's one of the things that you really enjoy doing in camp uh, beyond the hunting part or go taking a personal hunting? And what's the, one of the things that you kind of detest doing that has to get done? What are the, 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 the end of the spectrums for each of those? I would think I would think for me it, it actually might be the same thing the right off the start one of the things that the guys like to do to go along with if they and muck you you touched on this earlier was the cutting wood I, for whatever reason th these guys they come out wherever they come from whether it's a city or or whatever they love if they're done hunting they love cutting wood they love nothing better than to see a big tree yep. hit the ground and block it up and, and do that whole thing. And, and, and for me, cutting wood on the right day, you can go out and just cut a whole bunch of wood and it's, it's almost therapy. But then when it gets towards the end of the season, it's like the last thing you want to do is hear that chainsaw run and start fucking wood and moving wood. So, you know, for me, it's both. It's cutting wood is, is, is good and bad. Okay. <laughs> I enjoy cutting wood, though. I love splitting wood and cutting wood. But there isn't really anything that I hate at, at, in the guiding job. I love doing everything. I mean, getting up in the morning. I like, I like seeing the sunrise every morning. That's one of the biggest things. No matter for success, whether there's hunters in camp, I just, I'm a morning person. I love getting up in the morning. But I like doing everything. I really like caping. Blair, and, you're, uh, Blair you're lying. There's no way you like putting 2,000 white geese out in the morning. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I don't mind, actually, I like putting them, I'll put the blinds together, and then when, when I'm done putting all the layout blinds together, and that I'll help out with the decoys. But yeah, well, some mornings, but with waterfall, after you do it for 60 days straight of three in the morning every day, it does take its toll on you. And oh. you, you're the least, maybe that's one of the things by the end you don't want to put out any more decoy spreads. 
<laughs> for me, uh, 100%, uh, I hated bucket wood, especially towards the end of the year. You always have to buck enough wood for the people that stayed in all year round. So uh, the last couple weeks, if you weren't guiding, you were, you were splitting wood. Uh, and, you know, for me, you guys know this because you know me now. I love people. And so the best part of the non-hunting side was sitting on the side of a mountain and just getting to know that person, what, what they did for a living, what they had. I just found that so intriguing. The, uh, you know, and I don't know what the saying is, with the, like uh, when you talk to somebody and they know somebody and they know somebody, um, how when you're sitting on the side of a mountain and you're getting to know somebody, that he, like, for example, I guided a guy, his best friend was Dale Earnhardt Sr. before he passed away. And like, I was a big NASCAR fan. So I was blown away that this guy is going home and probably going to tell Dale Earnhardt about this hunt and, uh, and you know, stuff like that. So I, I was a, a people person. So I know lots of guys, um, they get kind of grouchy with their clients, especially later in the year, because like you said, Steve, you, you shake hands and you, you pass the trophy on to the guy leaving and then the guy coming is so exact. He, all he wants to is look around and he, and, and some guys get a little bit uh, grouchy because now they have to go through that whole routine again. Well, for me, it was a new adventure and uh, I, I just loved people. And um, I think in, in the 15 years that I was a guide, I only ever had con uh, conflict with one person uh, like where we just didn't mesh and uh other than that i because i like people so much that uh and it didn't it didn't hurt that i was in a really uh, game rich area so we didn't stress a whole lot about animals uh that's why I, primarily i didn't become a sheep guy because i didn't want to put 15 days of stuff on my back and then go on day 10 and still not get a ram because i know there's there can be tension there but for sure Hey fellas, I, I wrote a question down here and, and hopefully you can, you can answer this. It's a, it's a little bit different of a question, but uh, I know that it can be answered. What would you say to people um, about being a guide that they wouldn't realize? So, cause they, I guarantee they have an idea what we do, but what do you, what would you say to them um, uh, that uh, they wouldn't realize about being a guide? And I, and 20 what, hour work days. Yep. And what I was going to say is the money's crap. <laughs> if you think you're doing it for the money, you're not going to be uh, in that camp very long because a hundred dollars a day uh, does not go very far. And I'm, I, I, it's been a few years since I've guided, but I don't think they make more than maybe 125, 150 a day. It hasn't really gone up. No. Um, your tips are good money though that's the, and the way the dollar is right now that's what hurts yeah but I, well, I should say most guys like waterfall 150 a day canadian even for bear depends if you got your own equipment or not but yeah it's definitely something you're not going to get rich at to go so, back to your question i would i would think that maybe one of the one of the things that <laughs> that people don't realize about being a guide or or working in the in that industry is your people skills have to be top notch because if you're in if you're in bad weather or and you can't get out and hunt or if you know something didn't work out where you, you called an animal in maybe a guy misses or shot opportunity didn't happen or or, or something's just not you know you maybe not seeing the game right off the bat you have to be able to to deal with that person and, and improve their mood, keep spirits up and make conversation with them and be, be genuinely, just like you said, Mark, be genuinely interested in, in that person. And you, you know, on a mountain hunt, that's your best friend for 10 days because it's only you and them. And, and I think, I think the number one, the number one thing to, to keep spirits up is, is people skills. You have to, you really have to have good people skills. Well, you know what? Uh, I can, we can break it down just to, to elaborate what you're saying there, Steve. So this is when you're a guide, this is what, it, what you are. You're, you have to be a hunter. 
You have to be a, sort of a, a, a people person. You have to be a cook. You have to be a horse guy or, or if you don't do horses or anything like that. And you have to, sometimes you have to be really good with their field care of their animal. You have to be the type of person that could take adversity if it snows or rains and, or, or you get socked in. Uh, you have to, you know, you have to manage all that stuff and, and, and still try to, to keep that person positive. Uh, I remember Lonnie and I, we worked together for a long time. And one time the Valley socked in with, uh, with uh, fog and the, so the hunters were getting up in the morning, but it was so, it was like, it was right in your face, socked in. We just stuck our head in their cabin and said, we're not going hunting today or this morning, boys. You might as well stay in your, in your, uh, in your beds. They were okay with that. So Lonnie and I went back into bed and it was, it was foggy all day. And about two o'clock in the afternoon, we're still sleeping in our cabin. And the hunter slowly opens the door and peeks in and says, Muck, are we going hunting? And I'm like, we're not going hunting yet. And he, cl he closed the door. And, uh, and because we know, like we manage our time, we understand, you know, what's going on. They don't. And we just, I didn't articulate that to him well enough. The fog subsided. And the one, my hunter, we just went down the valley and killed a 55 inch bull moose that night. And, uh, <laughs> I, and, and I said to him, I said, that's how it works here. You, you, when you think that it's not going to come together, it will, you got to trust your guide. So, so, but sometimes, but it, those are the, that's what it takes when you're, a, when you're a guide, you really do have so have to wear so many hats. It's crazy. Um, we got a question here from Jay Manley. Jay says, uh, taking a similar path to you, Muck, currently a hunting guide pursuing your career in law enforcement. Good. Right on. Thanks, Jay. Yeah. Thanks, Jay. That's awesome. Uh, uh, you know, I just want to just briefly touch on that. Uh, guys, I, I, I know Darren, when we first met, I told you this, I, I really do get kind of emotional about, uh, about people and sharing information and stuff because I really do like helping people get better. I wouldn't be a police officer. I wouldn't be, I certainly wouldn't still be married. Uh, I wouldn't have probably uh, my beautiful, my son. Well, I had my daughter, she's older, but uh, my life wouldn't have taken the path it was if it wasn't for guiding. Like I, I, like I, I grew up on the side of the mountain because of all the things that I sort of outlined, the, the things that I had to take on and look after, you know, you got a guy that's a business guy. Like I remember I, I guided a guy from the vice president of Remington arms. And here I am at the time I was just a, a, a oil field workers that come guiding. And this guy's got just oodles of money and it's on my responsibility to make his trip good. So um, this gave me the life skills to become a police officer. And I've been a police officer now for 15 years. And uh, if it wasn't for the, 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 experiences on the side of the mountain i would have never went into policing i i, I probably would have took a different path in my life is what i'm saying i i don't know if i would have been um so passionate about policing if it wasn't for guiding i i totally agree i mean it opened a lot of doors for me as well i mean starting out as a 19 year old kid right fresh out of high school um if, if somebody would have told me i had to go in front of the class at school and make a speech there's no way i could have done that at 19 years old and now um i i'll park my truck in the walmart parking lot and get in the box and make a speech to whoever wants to listen it's yep. you know whether that's a good thing or a bad thing i don't know but um it, it definitely it changed my personality and made me a better person for sure because you you definitely go and and like you said you, you rode those horses out and into the middle of nowhere looking for somebody not knowing where you're going to go that builds confidence it gives you confidence it you, you deal with adversity you do all that stuff uh one of you guys said i can't remember maybe darren i think he said you call guides the swiss army knife or the utility knife it's it's true you you have to have basically a little bit of knowledge and deal with anything that comes up and 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 that confidence and that 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 you know feeling of of 
don't know how to put it, that you can basically walk into a situation not knowing what the outcome could be and, and you feel okay and, and you can deal with it. That really helps. It, it, it opens a lot of doors and, and uh, you know, can, can lead you to a place in your life that you never thought you'd end up. Yeah. Yeah, like you got to be great at being a troubleshooter and that, like you said, plan ahead and uh, be able to solve problems. I mean, you grow as a person when you tackle something, it's like adversity. I mean, you might be scared to try it, but if you try it, you do it, you learn from it, it's a learning curve. You make, making mistakes is the, is the best way to learn. And I mean, you just gotta, you gotta do your best, but being a good problem solver, it helps. And you learn over the years and that you take that. And I mean, you grow as a person and it, and it works out in the end. And I'm, I'm glad I did it too. I mean, I learned a lot of things. I worked on the oil rigs too for 16 years plus uh, farm. So, and I just love being outdoors and it, 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 it was great. You know, I'm, I like being a, pe a people person and I, I'm a practical joker in camp and sense of humor. I always like to, to joke around. Like I said, my hunter, rookie hunters, when they're climbing the ladder stand, I'll spray their boots with caramel. And that first night in the stand, they'll have bears coming up their ladder. And I, I like to joke around like that. So <laughs> it kind of breaks it up, but yeah, I like to have fun. Guys, another thing that I wrote down that uh, we kind of touched on, but one of the questions I had for you guys is, um, I guarantee people want to know what your job, not your job description, but what are your job duties as a guide? Blair, you start off. Oh, different camps is different things like uh, waterfall camp. You got to have your trucks, trailers, decoys, shotgun shells loaded four in the morning. You got to be ready to go. You got to make sure your hunters are up and everybody's ready to go. They got the licenses, guns, shells. You got to be organized. Like it, it helps. I have OCD bad. So I like to plan and be very well organized. Just less chance of failure that way. But like I said, same thing in deer camp. Up at four in the morning, I start a fire in the shop from the stove, make sure all the quads, everything's full of fuel, everything's running, warmed up. You make sure all the hunters are up having breakfast and getting them ready. And then you take everybody out with, with bear and uh, deer. You take everybody out. And then the rest of the day, you're baiting, checking cameras, you're cutting wood, you're caping, you're deboning. You're always doing something. You're never sitting still. You're cleaning the kitchen. You're doing something. You're helping out in camp. And that with waterfall, we clean birds as well. So we get up. I get up at 3.30. I'm in camp at 4. Leave camp with the hunters out to the field. You do a setup as soon as we switch off sitting with the hunters too so then the other guy go we all go scouting whoever's not sitting with the hunters go scouting and then you get back you pack up the spread and the hunters you go back to camp have breakfast you go clean birds as soon as you're done cleaning birds you go out for the afternoon shoot you do the whole setup then you go back out scouting then you come back to camp and have supper and then you go home to bed it's just a, a routine see people would not understand the amount of work that you just detailed there like that's amazing 120 times in 60 some days you're setting up those decoys like in and out of the trailer every day every day non-stop <laughs> you do steve, get burnt out at the end steve you your day would probably be very similar to mine so i'll let you kind of explain what your day would look like as a guide or your sure. duties. it's uh well i guess it depends on daylight you or where you're going to be if you're out in a spike camp um you're you're up a couple hours before daylight. You're getting you know everything organized, like you said, whether it's it's jingling horses or it's fueling ATVs or getting backpacks ready. You're you're looking after the hunter, getting them up. You're making breakfast. You're packing all the gear for the day. You're out. You're out before daylight. You're into the spot. You're doing your morning hunt. Um, whether it's climbing a mountain or getting into a swamp, calling moose, whatever you got to do. Um, do your day's hunting you get back if you kill something who knows when your day is going to end um you, you may get back to camp the next morning that's just the way it is if not you're back to camp usually about an hour hour and a half after dark if you're planning ahead maybe you got something out for supper idling on the wood stove so then you stoke the fire back up get the gear separated get the horses looked after you come back you make supper 
you get everything dialed in, you get your hunter sorted out. Usually they got some sort of catastrophic gear failure you got to deal with or something like that. And uh, you get them put to bed, you, uh, you get everything sorted out for the morning. You get five, six, six hours of sleep is a good night and you're up doing it again. Um, and that doesn't even include if you get an animal, the, the butchering and, and then coming back to camp and keeping it for the next five hours. A hundred percent. Yeah. If you got something down, it's who knows when your day is going to end, whether, you, you know, can you get the horses in there? Can you get the ATV in there? Are you going to have to backpack this thing out? What's the best course of action? Do you block it up, you know, and, and come back in the morning? Do you, how are you going to deal with this? So you, you know, you got to kind of roll with every situation, every situation. So you need well, to that goes back to Blair's uh, comment about just, being like moving around and, and just taking things all in perspective and, and being able to work on the, a moment's, a moment's seconds notice about, okay, what should I do here, here, here. And because the only person that knows you're panicking is you. That's right. Right. They, you still have to come up with that front, that face that, you know what, you got everything under control and you have all these things spinning around in your head and you got to make the best decision. So the Swiss army knife, just like call yeah. it. You know, if you, if you really, if, when it comes to a guide, the actual hunting itself is such a very small part of what goes on because, uh, and I mean, obviously the hunter paid for an experience. So we're, you, I mean, most hunters will help out, but for when it comes to a guide that the hunting is a sort of a break for us when we, when we're actually, when we're actually riding the horse or calling an elk or calling a moose or looking at a stone sheep or something, that's, that's, that's actually relaxing. It's the other stuff that are, that you guys outline is what's, what is the worst part about being a guide. That's the daily grind, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. Well, especially when it's uh, on the last day they hunt and they kill something right at dark and they got to fly out. It's a six, oh. seven minute mark. Oh. So you got to deal with finding it. Uh, like you said, loading it, skinning it, gutting the boning cape and getting all that so they can take it with them. <laughs> oh boy. I've had That's a few things. That's bittersweet, hey? Like, you're just happy that they got, but that's, that's <laughs> what You know you're not getting any sleep that night. No. <laughs> uh, so, you know, Blair, I'm not sure how, how extensive you've been kind of in the backcountry like these other two, but when maybe the season's over for you and with Muck and with Steve, um, your season's done, what's the first thing that you do when the season's done? Like, do you go to that local establishment and have a pint? Um, do you have a certain meal? Is there something you do to celebrate the, the end of this, the season? What's the kind of the traditional thing that you used to do or do? Or It's funny you should say that. For me, uh, every, every year that I guided, the first day I came out, I went to KFC. And and it was it was it it would it was literally a, a tradition for Lonnie and I because we ate elk and moose and all that kind of stuff for so long that we didn't get any chicken or anything like that. So we went to KFC the very night we got out. We'd go to the hotel. Uh, there's a hotel in Fort St. John called the Four Seasons, and we actually named our guide's cabin the Four Seasons. And <laughs> so whenever we would go when we get out and we get dropped off, we pick our vehicles up at the airport and we head right to KFC. Well, uh, or Steve, go ahead. Oh, for me, it was, uh, when I was guiding in the mountains, um, backpacking, the first thing I went for, we always used to talk big, say the same thing. We're going to KFC or we're going to Burger King or something like that. But the first thing you craved when you got out of the mountains was a salad something green because you hadn't <laughs> anything but freeze-dried crap for however many days so yeah no I was looking for something green and usually a, a cold beer was good too so. yeah. yeah 60 days straight of bacon and eggs or beans and stuff yeah it takes its toll do you guys have any tradition or uh any uh superstitions uh, superstitions when yeah. you're guiding I know I did I I would never I would never shave till I killed an animal. That was my, that was my superstition. I always like to shave my head at the beginning of bear season, but that's just because of the ticks. <laughs> <laughs> Our yeah. superstitions with, with clothing though, 
like like certain hunting clothing i gotta have my hat or a certain jacket every year like for guiding it's superstitious in a way just like hockey i guess i definitely did too i wore the exact same hat every year for 15 years it's a notre dame fighting irish hat almost every picture that i was in i don't i don't really have any superstitions like like that like clothing or anything like that but there's certain things that if i'm out in the out in the hills and i'm guiding and something happens i'll be like oh no i don't want to do that or because that might cause bad karma you know i'm all about you know you know d don't shoot that that squirrel because you know it might screw the whole hunt up or something like that like it's i get a little bit bad juju that way but other than that no say darren you got much more there or where are you at no i'm good so I just got a couple more and then we'll be able to wrap her up. So guys, if, uh, if you were to give one tip to somebody that walked up to you and maybe you've given this tip away already to them, what would that be? Uh, and, and you don't have to limit it to one, but what would you give as a tip to somebody if they wanted to get started? Oof. Well, while you're thinking of it, I have, I have two. And these are sort of learning from my mistakes. One, if you're going to be a good guide, start off with good equipment. Because there's nothing worse than showing up to camp with, with uh, you know, mediocre binoculars that are going to fog up or, or t rain gear that doesn't work because that literally will ruin your whole uh, trip is if you have shoddy equipment. So that's the first one is if you're going to be a guide and you do so happens to get a, a, a job, start off with good equipment, do whatever it takes w within your means to, 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 to do that. And then the other one would be, uh, if you don't, if you don't have experience, then do whatever you can to go visit a taxidermist and learn how to cape before you go. Uh, or, uh, or, or find somebody like us that you could go there and, and find out. But I'd say if you're going to be a mountain guide, go learn to ride horses before you apply for an outfitter. They won't, most guys won't hire you if you don't have any, any uh, horse experience whatsoever. Those are mine. Yeah. I, w I would agree with the gear thing a hundred percent. I'm a big, I'm a big stickler for boots me personally i mean if your feet hurt you can't you can't operate that's your number one thing that you gotta gotta deal with and i i don't spare the money on boots if, if i find a boot that that fits me good and and will last me a good full season or or better i think 400 to 500 dollars is is a reasonable amount of money for a pair of boots but i agree gear is it, it can make or break your your it if you don't have good gear, if you're wet or you're cold and your hunter's not wet or cold, you can't be effective in guiding. You have to be, you have to be able to tough it out more than that. I mean, it doesn't matter if you're in the goose blind or you're on the side of a mountain. It, it, if, if you're not comfortable, you're not effective. That's right. The big thing too is you got to have a good spouse at home too because you got you to gotta be willing to make sacrifices. You're going to be home for a long, like away from home for a long time. You got to be willing to make sacrifices. And I mean, you got to put yourself into your job. But like you said, equipment's a big thing. Good boots, like you said, you got to have good hunting boots. You can't be getting blisters or wet feet and stuff. You just, you're no good if you can't walk. Guys, I could have a whole program on how crappy my gear was the very, very first year that I went guiding. And I'm not kidding. I showed up with uh, uh, like, $50 Bushnell binoculars. Uh, you know, I showed up, you know, remember those small pup tents, those little orange ones? That's what I went to the Yukon with was a small orange pup tent that didn't even have a rain fly. Like that's the kind of stuff that I went because I didn't know any, nobody ever told me what I needed. And, and the worst thing is, is if you're in a mountain outfit and your outfitter brings you stuff in, he's charging you a bush fee. At least mine did. <laughs> Uh, got two questions here, uh, Muck. So yep. we got uh, Brock has asked um, for all three of you guys optics. 
uh, what's everybody using for optics and uh, possible some suggestions for optics? Good question. Well, yeah, I'll start, I guess. Well, for me, um, I'm a Vortex guy. I, I use Vortex everything. And, and, and that comes down to uh, Vortex glass is, is sort of comparable to Europe, European glass. And the warranty is second to none. I have went through so many binoculars, so many spotting scopes over the years because they were just, I just, I didn't have the money. So I bought the cheapest I could. And you're on, you're in, you're on a goat hunt for seven days and it rains for five of them. Your, your optics have to be waterproof. And if they're not, it's going to fog up and then you can't see. So I, I use a vortex. Um, and, and I will say when it comes to power, the, what I tell this to everybody, the best all around power, in my opinion, for hunting is eight by 42s. You get the best field of view and you can, and yet it lets enough light in that you can see early mornings, late nights. If, if you get into 10 by fifties, you're going to, it's going to be too shaky. Now guys like us that make our living with optics, we can get away with 10 power binoculars because we know how to keep them still when we need to. But I like hunters that show up with 10 power and they're on the back of a horse and they're doing this because a horse won't sit still. They can't see anything. So eight by 42s and it'll take that shake out. That's a good tip. Sorry, 10 by 42s. Sorry. Yeah, no, you're right. I agree. Eight by 42s or 10 by 42s, same thing. And I got all Vortex stuff as well. And I mean, that's the thing. Don't cheap out on optics. It makes a big difference because I've seen a lot of hunts get ruined with cheap optics. Yeah. Um, for for binos, I 100% agree. I'm I'm in that that same school of thought. And I'm running Vortex now too for my binos. I've I've uh, same as you've gone through a ton a ton of binoculars over the years and Vortex. Their warranty, you can't beat it. Uh, I did splurge a few years ago, and I bought myself a Swarovski spotting scope. Um, is 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 that spotting scope any better than one that's half the price? Probably not. I mean, ultimately, something that's in that thousand to fifteen hundred dollar range is probably just as good. Um, and then when you talk of rifle optics, I I'm a from old school. I'm a loophole guy, um, but recently I've gotten a couple of, of Vortex rifle scopes and I'm very, very happy with them. And I'm the keep it simple three to nine guy, three to nine by 42. It's, or 40, I should say. And, and yeah, uh, Vortex and loophole for me. You know, the thing, the thing with, with Vortex, and I know that I'm a Vortex guy, so I'm, I'm a little bit biased in the sense that I, but the thing with, like the vortex, the, the reason that they're so good is their glass, like they still have the entry level optics as well as they have the premium optics, but it doesn't matter what level you're at. If even good optics will fail, you send them back, they take care of you. There's no, there's no ands, ifs, or buts. And I think that's why, sure, you can buy their entry level and they're very good, but you also have to think about what your application is. Am I watching birds? Or am I going to be on a 10 day goat hunt where I possibly could get snow, rain, sun, all that stuff. So you kind of have to, you have to say, well, what my application is. If I'm going to sit in a deer blind and then just look for deer, you can get away with maybe a lower price. But, but the thing is the razors or the, the crossfires, they both can fail, but you send them back and they look after you. Yeah, I agree. I've sent back, I send my Vortex binoculars and spotting scope in every year. They clean them up and fix because I, I mean, I beat the crap out of them. And they take the abuse. But like you said, you send them away, they send them back, they either send you brand new ones or fix them. Yep. It's, it, they're great. Yeah, and I've got a set of power diamonds that are great. Like, I, I'm really happy with them. Jay's got a question. Um, how would you guys deal with a client that thinks they know more than the guide? And an outfitter starts telling you to do whatever, do, do to how to do everything. Ran into a few of these over the years. Um, I'll tell you what, we got a rule board in camp. There's a big rule board right in camp that every hunter's got to read. The number one rule is don't guide the guide. And that's the rule they have to follow in camp. 100%, yeah. You know, I've, I've said, you know, fellas, I, I, I don't know about you guys, but 
Darren knows this. I've never killed an elk. Of all the elk that I've guided for, I've never shot one myself. And I've often said, someday I can afford to get one. I'm not going to be that guide the guide guy because I know exactly the type of person you're talking about. Every That should be on their contract when they sign a contract. Don't guide the guide because that's 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 exactly it. Like, I, uh, a few years ago, I had a fisherman who had been at the lodge that I work at for like years, like 20 years he'd been a repeat customer. And I know I was fairly new at the lodge. This would be 12 years ago or something like that. And he jumped in my boat and we went out fishing. And the first two spots were pretty slow. Like we're talking a couple small fish. And uh, it was just one of those days where the weather wasn't cooperating, whatever. And you just grind it out until you figure the pattern. And as we get into the third spot, he's like, I think we should fish over there. And I was like, okay, well, how will we fish this? And then we'll go over there. Well, that spot didn't turn out on my side. So he's like, I want to fish over there. Okay. So I drove him over there. We fished. He goes, well, I want to go over here. Okay. So we drove over there. And fished. We fished four of his spots. We didn't catch any fish. And I just was standing in the back of the boat waiting. And he quit casting and he reels up and he's staring at me. And he goes, well, what are we going to do now? And I go, how about we fish some of my spots? He's like, okay. And we took off and we had a reasonably good day after that. But yeah, sometimes you just got to, you got to be personable and roll with it and handle the situation. Read your customer, right? You got to know if you can joke around with the guy or if he's, the one thing I did realize, and I'm, pardon me if I'm getting a little long-winded here, guys, but like you said, when you guided that Remington guy, you know, you're, you're some far or some Saskatchewan kid in the bush. And all of a sudden you've got this head of a major CEO of a company. Well, it, it's, it's sometimes pretty hard for these guys that maybe are in charge of four five, 600, a thousand people and dealing with a multi-million dollar company to all of a sudden listen to a 25 year old kid in the middle of the bush. Right. Like, yep. it, and it was something that I had to learn as I got older was that, you have to really, you have to play each customer differently because, you know, they're not used to taking orders. They're used to having everybody kiss their butt and they're, they're the boss, they're in charge. So, you know, it's a different dynamic. And uh, if you, if you work it out right, like you said, they become your friends. And, and I mean, I'm lucky enough to have some, some fairly successful people that I call friends in, in North America. So yeah, it's, I would piggyback off what you said, Steve, and just say what I did to avoid that conflict was I was really good about, um, see, I think, I think guides tend to take over the hunt and just let the guy shoot and people don't want that. So what I like to do is I, I encourage my hunters to call. I encourage them to of course spot and all that kinds of stuff. I, it's their hunt. I'm just there really to supplement for them. So the only, I mean, the only time that I was really hard, and I think you guys probably are too, is when it came to safety. When it came, if he's walking behind me, I need to know there's not a round in the chamber so I don't get, I don't get shot. And, and, and when it, that's the only time that I was really a, a, a hard ass about to my hunters is when it came to safety. Other than that, if they wanted to call or if they wanted to do this or that, uh, I mean, obviously we knew the area, so th I didn't find a lot of people try to dictate to me where we should go, but uh, I was really good about interacting with them. I mean, I would say to them all the time, they're like, oh, I don't know how to call. I'd be like, give it a try. We're out in the middle of the wilderness. Best spot. So I, I, that's how I avoided it. I, I, I I, uh, plus, like I said, I'm a people person. So I wanted to learn their, their, what, what make, what made them tick. So by the, by the time we usually got into one or two days, I sort of knew what they liked and didn't like, or that's what I did. Usually the best, uh, the best ways of dealing with conflict is having people add to the conversation and how could you, you know, just roll with it and say, Hey, what are some suggestions? You know, you come with a problem, what's, what's your solution, right? So. But it, it's tough in the waterfall side of it like that because you get a lot of clients, they want to bring their dogs. Well, of course, they tell you their dogs are the best. And 99% of the time, they're not. But they want to bring their dog along on a hunt. But in the first couple hunts, he might do good. But then the rest, like if there's five, six clients and the guy's dog's messing up the hunt, his hunting partners will tell him when we get back to camp, 
yeah, maybe you shouldn't take your dog out this afternoon. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> you let them deal with it themselves when there's a group of eight hunters like that. But then, like you said, with the safety issue, with waterfall, you got eight guns out at the end of that layout line. You've got to watch and control because we, we've had a few where, where a couple guys tried leaning over the side of the blind, shooting with the shotgun, like not really shouldered properly. And the, and the semi-automatic goes, and then the gun took off again and fired off his arm. Hey, like, Blair, how did you deal with guys that wanted to call? Because I know in Waterfall, uh, you, you, know, you can screw it up by a, a crappy caller. Well, a lot of them bring calls, but like I said, it sorts itself out when you got eight guys coming on a trip like that and their buddy brings this call out. Sure, give her, you can call. But then if you're calling shitty, they're just harping on him and he puts his call away. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it settles itself out. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's what it is. They settle themselves out like that. Like they bring their dog and then the buddies will harp on him for a day or two. Go bring your dog in the morning. Go bring your dog. Look how many birds we lost. We should have had more birds. Or the same thing with the call too. Man, you sound horrible. Put that call away. And they'll give it to him. They'll rib him right in the blind. They'll holler at him and tell him, put that call away. Uh, so as always, I know we got a couple co uh, questions in the text here, guys, but as always, I'm going to go one by one. I'll unmute your, your mics guys. If you have a question, go ahead. If not, just say, nope, and we'll move on and then we'll wrap it up. So I'll start with Bobby. Bobby, I'm going to unmute you. If you've got a question for anybody, go ahead. You there, Bobby? Yeah. I There. Go ahead, Bobby. I think I, I uh, muted you by accident there. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, no, I don't think I got anything here. Um, nope. Not that I can think of. Okay. Thanks, Bobby. Okay, Brock, I know you asked a question, but I'm sure you, you hopefully you have another one. I'm going to unmute you, Brock. I missed kind of the first half. I don't know if you guys covered it or not, but uh, what's the scariest situation you guys been in guiding? I'm sure you've all been in lots. I, 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 was I was thinking about that question. Thanks for bringing it up, Brock. Great question. Uh, I, I, I've been chased by grizzlies twice, once on foot, once on a horse. That's the scariest for me. I have a really good, a really funny story, but catch me sometime when we're sitting down having a drink and uh, I'll tell it to you. It's, uh, it's long, but believe me, it's worth it. It's, uh, it's a funny, 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 scary story. But just be, just being chased by bears is for me. Same thing here. I've been chased by quite a few different bears. Uh, we were bluff charged by a sow, and I hit her with a full can of pepper spray, point blank range. She did not back down. I like we were backpedaling. It was unbelievable. And I mean, I a lot of wounded bears. I remember one time in the dark. Well, it was just about dark. We I was crawling through the brush basically on my hands and knees. I come face to face about two feet away from the bear and I see him blink like this. And I just turn around and I said, get over here with your gun. And I look and he's <laughs> running back. He took off with the rifle. And I'm following. And we had to go back to the quads and get the hunter and come back with the rifle and finish the bear off. But I'll never forget that, that bear like this. And then he blinked. <laughs> That's a great story. That's a great oh. story. And he's running with the rifle yet. He's got the gun and he's running because I said, okay, he's there. Oh, no, he's still alive like that. Oh, no. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I got goosebumps just listening to that because I could, I'm going to. Steve? Uh, well, mine would be bear stories too, but I mean, I can't follow that one up. That's, that's yeah. it. <laughs> I'll never forget that as long as I live face to face. <laughs> And when that bear blinked, they said, he's still alive. Get over here. And the, the <laughs> hunter's running 75 yards back to the quad. <laughs> oh, that's a great story. Okay, Brock, thanks for the question. Thanks for joining. Uh, and Jay, I'm on. Go ahead, Jay. Everyone hear me good? I'm uh, up north in Candle Lake and pulled up to the cell phone tower to get service. So hopefully it, uh, <laughs> you can hear me good. Yep. Yep. Uh, yeah. I guess kind of my question, more of like a conversation would be, uh, how would you guys, if you had a certain amount of clients, how do you pick which guys to send to which spots? I know a lot of our guys would kind of already have it decided if they were returning customers, but if they were new guys, how would you kind of decide which guys would go where and who would go to the honey hole? Well, for our, at our camp, 
it uh, primarily went with uh, physical ability and personality. Uh, I don't know the process that the outfitters do, and maybe Steve, you can speak on this, uh, of how they, you know, the interactions they have with the hunters prior to coming to camp. But I know uh, almost all the, the hunters that I guided, I knew in advance that I was getting them. So somehow they um, matched them up with me. But I, I do know most of them was like, uh, the physical abilities because I was a, I didn't like, like I wasn't a horse guy. I wasn't a cowboy. So I primarily hunted on foot and then just used the horses to pack it out. So I always had a, tried to get the hell, uh, the good fit guys. But for me, that's, um, that's how it was with us anyways. For sure. And like, as, as far as what I do, um, when I'm talking to these guys, prior to booking a hunt and then once they book and and really I try to keep it very personal and and try to really pick their brain about what they're looking for out of a hunt whether it's um, whether they're really focused on the trophy or they're really focused on the experience or if it's horseback or if they don't care or you know it, I, I pick their brains in a in a in a bunch of ways and try to ask the right questions so that when they get there I'm going to put them in the right spot where they're going to see the scenery that they want. They're going to, you know, do they want to stay in a cabin? Do they want to stay in a wall tent? Do they want a backpack? Do they want to, you know, what are they looking for out of that hunt? And once I go through kind of my mental checklist and I can go, okay, well, that guy belongs here and, or that guy needs to, to hunt this way or, and some guys, some guys don't even really, they think they know what they want. And then you start really talking to them and then they're like, Oh no, that, yeah, no, that sounds good or something so you really gotta everybody's different and and as far as a honey hole uh for me uh, with being in the mountains it, like i don't really get to run trail cameras and, and focus in on specific animals and stuff like that so it the honey hole thing really doesn't doesn't affect me so it's more of an experience thing i'm i'm trying to give them the experience that they want so i work it that way that's almost you know, a good thing not I, having the trail cameras and one, one last thing for our camp um, that I forgot to mention before Blair says his is um, it, ha it depends on the species they're going to hunt because at our camp, it was so big that we had so many camps. Like we had guides specifically for goats, guides specifically for elk, guides specifically for moose, and then guides specifically for goats. So you came into camp, they would ask you what was your first animal and that, determines a lot where you went so if you came in you said i want 100 percent. i want to shoot a mountain goat first then they went to the guides with the mountain goats first so in our camp it had a lot to do with what species was your was your primary yeah Blair? like with our camp to do with the deer and, and the bears and stuff with the trail cameras you can target certain like guys will come to camp they'll want a color phase or a blaze so you can match them up to the bait site to the animal they want or I want a big four point or I want a buck with a sticker or a drop time. So you can basically match, match guys up. But when you get a bigger group of guys and we, we draw names out of a hat to make it fair, we'll, we'll draw names out of a hat. And then that way nobody gets jealous or thinks they're getting favoritism from us. Even with repeat guys, just draw a name out of a hat and you, and you get that bait for the week. Okay. Well, thanks Jay for joining us. Uh, uh, I'm going to mute you back here. So, Hey fellas, one thing that I want to ask you, because I know real quick, we try to, we'll try to keep the story and we, so we can wrap it up. Every guy has got that lucky story. And I, I know I have one on the, uh, that I know I'm going to tell, but uh, I'll, and while you think of it, I'll tell mine. So it gives you a minute to think about it and I'll keep it short. So I, I was in camp. I was done guiding for elk I was waiting for my other hunter to come in so a guide comes in with a hunter that they killed their elk but he had a goat tag but that the guide refused to go goat hunting so Gary came to me and says Muck I'm going to fly you to goat camp and take this guy on a one day goat hunt and I said well there's no way he's going to get a one a goat in one day it's impossible there I mean it takes a day just to pack in he goes I know take him up there and he's not going to get a goat just to make them happy. And I'm like, sure, whatever. So they fly me into to goat camp. 
there's already two guides and two hunters in camp and neither one have got their goat yet. And I show up in the 185 with the hunter and I say to the guys, hey, 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 because they're right away, they're like mad. Why is there another guide and hunter in camp? I said, guys, this is just a scenery trip. I'm going to go on a horse and we're going to go down the river and I'm going to show them the tops of the mountains and we're, we're, we're not going to kill a goat. And they're like, okay. So the next morning, the three of us went out and got the horses. They went off to their goat goat country i'm like we're and my hunter's like where are we going muck i said well we're gonna ride west down the creek we rode for two hours and my eyes were like this an eight inch billy goat right on the creek so we tied our <laughs> we tied our horses up and the the, the goat saw us, so he kind of runs 50 60 yards up to, heading towards the mountain hunter shoots him boom drops him right from the gravel bar so we go there <laughs> We caped them out. We packed them back to camp. I've got it stretched out in front of the fire at camp and I've got supper on the go and I'm caping the thing out. Those other guides come back and they're kids. Are you kidding me? I said, Char right from the gravel bar. So that, that's the luckiest hunt I've ever had in my life. <laughs> that's, that's exceptionally lucky. That's awesome. <laughs> An eight inch billy goat. I couldn't believe it right from the gravel bar. Um, for me, one, one that pops into my head right now is I was guiding, uh, I was guiding black bears up by, uh, North Meadow Lake. This is quite a few years ago and had a guy that was just snake bit. He came up with a bunch of other guys. We had a full camp that week and he just could not get a bear. He just, you know, it was sows and cubs. And if a boar came in, it was quick and he didn't get a shot. And so last day, last evening, um, I had a bait that I had been running and there was one decent bear there, but very inconsistent. And I thought, well, we'll go there. Maybe we get lucky. I drive them in. It was, I think the second last week of the season. So I was tired. Um, I drive them in, get them all set up and, and set them in the tree stand. I drive the ATV back probably three quarters of a mile. There was a big hill and I was evening hunt. I laid back and put my head between the handlebars and my feet on the back rack. I've got like my rubber boots sticking off the back rack. I fall asleep, nice warm afternoon. And you get that feeling sometimes. And I open my eyes and I look between my rubber boots and there's this black bear staring at me between my, my rubber boots. And it's that bear, the bear that we wanted. And I was like, just kind of sit up real slow. And I go, well, why don't you, uh, why don't you just keep moving on go to the bait bud. And he just kind of puts his nose up in the air, sniffs a little bit and just walks off the trail. And I just kind of leaned back and I had barely fallen back asleep. And I hear boom, I fire the quad up, drive down. And sure enough, that bear just walked right from <laughs> me, awesome. walked right down to the bait, but he got it and we were done. It wasn't even, wasn't even getting on dusk. It was, we were back plenty of daylight back at camp. So that was a super lucky one. That's a great story. <laughs> but, uh, just like this, actually this past fall, we had hunters from Mexico hunting uh, archery bear, fall bear. Same thing, guy hunted all week, sat six days, was on his last evening, and they had to leave earlier, so I had to get him on the stand a little bit earlier in the day. We were getting down from the stand. I had the quad in the, his, his uh, bow case right by the barrel. We, he just touched the ground, and I turned and looked, and here, that target black bear is walking in, and he shot him at like 15 yards. Jeez. I couldn't believe it. Like, like, we were both standing on the ground, and that bear just come right into the barrel like that. Like pure luck. But I got one more other one I want to tell because I know Dean probably won't watch this, but we had Cabela's Ultimate Outdoor Adventures. We had a big film crew and we were doing the waterfall thing. And for some reason that night, the spotters, we could, nobody could find a field. So we had the film crew and these big head honcho guys from Cabela's and we didn't have a field spotted out for the next day. <laughs> so we, we, I suggested a field that I'd seen birds in two days before, but you never, ever want to go to a hunt on a field where you did not see birds there the night before <laughs> but we hit it right we come in the morning and fluked it off them birds showed up and not a single person spotted that field the night before like oh. that's luck and that's a film crazy. crew yet i think he, like that and that time i think he had to pay like 15 grand for this film crew to make a dvd for us wow <laughs> that, that, sweat off the brow that morning well, well fellas uh Darren, you got anything before we part? 
No, just again, you know, Blair, thanks for, for joining us, you know, full, full of knowledge and, and uh, enjoy you having on. Steve, as always, uh, you don't disappoint. Um, many thanks for coming in over the years into my class. And when I, when I saw you at the co-op the other day, I was like, hey, we're thinking about doing a guide one. And, and you're one of the guys that came to my mind. We had a couple other people that couldn't make it as well, but you're one of the guys on my list I wanted to get a hold of. And, um, you know, all through this whole pandemic that's going on, I know you got some stuff you're doing, going to do at your camp. Um, you know, we'll get through this and, and uh, continue the success of what you're doing. And uh, one of these days, I'll have to make it up there and we'll do something together. But, um, you know, thanks again, Steve. It's always been a, it's always a pleasure to have you and, and uh, pick your brain and get some of that experience out of, you, out of your brain and, and out in the open and share with everybody. I appreciate well, you asking that, but. Yeah, uh, I, uh, I, I can't uh, thank you guys enough to, um, for joining us. And uh, Blair, you're going to have to be the co-co-host here. You're just uh, our go-to guy. It's awesome. Uh, thanks. Oh, no, I love, I love doing this, especially in COVID times like this, and especially because I didn't have a big bear on trail camera today. So. <laughs> Well, uh, I was just I was just texting Darren today, and I said uh, I'm going up Wednesday. I'm going to spend quite a bit of time up there. I said when I when I check those cameras, you better be on speed dial. So <laughs> we're going to get Darren a good bear this year. But anyways, we're going to wrap it up. Thanks again to you guys. Thanks for everybody joining. And uh, uh, one thing I didn't do is draw names from last week's program for the Cabela's gift cards, but uh, I will do that. It's been kind of a hectic week. And I will, uh, if you like or share this program after it's posted, uh, I've got a couple of gift cards to give away again. So thanks again, guys, and stay safe. And uh, we'll talk to you soon. Right on. Thanks, fellas. For sure, right on.